Hallelujah. Lord, we love to worship you more than we want to take our next breath because it's in you and by you that we have all things. You have redeemed us. You have washed us and made us clean. Lord, you have washed us in your precious blood, the most precious substance in the universe. You have filled us and baptized us with the Holy Ghost and with fire. You have kept us. You have sustained us. You have healed us. You are the friend who sticks closer than a brother. And Lord, in the middle of the night when no one else is there, you are still there. You will never leave us, never forsake us. You are the wisdom giver, the joy giver. You are the sweet rose of Sharon and the lily of the valley, our bright and morning star, our alpha and our omega. Lord, you are our beginning and our ending. You are our everything tonight. And Lord, we have not come, not one, I don't believe one has come or one is tuned in tonight just to hear somebody's three points in a poem. Everybody's far too busy for that. We have come to meet with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. We have come to be changed from glory to glory to glory. We have come to have you do spiritual surgery deep on the inside of us, to rearrange us. We have come to be set ablaze once again. We have come to hear from heaven and we will never look back. We have come hungry, thirsty, desperate, sensitive to your voice. So Holy Spirit, these are your people. It's your word. It's your anointing. It's your plan and purpose. It's your fire. It's your covenant. They are your promises. So we are so totally dependent upon you tonight to come and do whatever you want to do. We will not stop you. We will not hinder you. We will not get in your way. But we have come to find out about the service that's going on in heaven. We're not asking you to come and bless ours. We're hooking up with yours, Lord. And we step in. We step over into that glory realm. And there will not be one who can leave here the same way they came in. There will not be one watching by way of the internet or television or satellite or cable. There will not be one within reach of our voice that will be absent of your presence. And so, Lord, don't let one leave or turn off that dial the way they came in Jesus' name. Not bound, oppressed, tormented, sick, or lame. For the Holy Ghost of Acts is still the same. And we will give you all of the praise, all of the worship, all of the glory, all of the honor. For it all belongs unto you both now and forevermore. In the wonderful name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, we pray. Amen and amen and amen. Hallelujah. 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 <laughs> Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Well, if you can be seated, I feel the Holy Ghost in this house tonight. If you can be seated, want to be seated, you are welcome to be seated. We want to welcome not only everyone in this building tonight, but every one of you watching by way of the internet or satellite or however you are watching. Welcome to number 1,451 of the stand. Hallelujah. And on behalf of doctors, pastors, Rodney and Adonica Howard Brown, I am privileged to be here tonight as one who was touched under this ministry 32 years ago now. <laughs> I can't even, I'm trying to figure out who's saying that. That can't be me. And, uh, and my life 
my ministry was forever changed. And it's still being changed from glory to glory. From glory to glory. And I am hungrier and thirstier tonight than the first night I was touched in revival. How many others can say that? How many will at least say this, if you weren't able to raise your hand, that I'm not as hungry as I should be, but oh, I want to get that hungry. So I'm willing to let God do anything he wants to do deep on the inside of me tonight. And I promise you that he is going to meet you right there. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, how many were in the service this morning? How many were not? You're not going to be in trouble. I just want to see. Okay. Pastor delivered something very powerful that I doubt was said in any other pulpit today in America or anywhere in the world. And as he talked about the agenda, he really wanted to get into much more for the next three years that the spirit of Antichrist, still alive in the earth today, has planned against the body of Christ and really against humanity because the devil hates man. The devil hates God's creation. And, of course, he ran out of time to deliver everything he would have liked to, but how many went, whoa, thank God we can come to a place where we hear the truth? That it isn't just put under a rock and we aren't a bunch of ostriches burying our head in the sand trying to pretend this isn't going on. But you're coming to a place, and those of you watching online, where you're going to get the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help him God. And the, now, maybe this was a shock to your system, and it should be. I mean, we shouldn't just go, wow, so this is happening. We should be going, dear God, how evil can people be? And it should shake us up enough to go, wait a minute. I'm part of the blood-bought church, and this isn't going to happen on my watch. I know how to pray. I know how to intercede. I'm a soul winner. I'm a fire starter. I'm a nation shaker, and I'm called and alive for such a time as this, and I'm going to take my place in the body of Christ, and this is not going to happen on our watch. And so as some of us had the privilege of eating lunch with, with pastors today, he decided to have a little experiment. And uh, how many have ever played with AI on your phone? I mean, I've done it a little bit since I first started hearing about it. I asked AI one day to give me an old-fashioned Acts 2 Pentecostal birth of the church sermon. And I couldn't believe what those robots started spewing out. I was almost going hallelujah. I mean, it, it, was, it was like, man, I need to get as on fire as AI. But <laughs> they, they do know how to put a lot of information together. And so pastor started to just ask general questions about what he talked about today. Tell me what happened at the convention um, I, I'm trying to remember the official name, but this convention of, of everybody in the travel agency uh, coming together where airlines, hotels, Airbnbs, restaurants, all of this coming together. And it started spewing out everything he preached today. Then he decided to get a little bit more specific. And he would say, well, what are the main points? Because it was going on forever. What are the main takeaway points from this? And it started talking about, it's all about pro protecting the environment and how people, the carbon, you know, um, credits and footprints and all the things he was talking about. And then he said, what happens if I have a conference of, say, 10,000 people and I don't obey these rules and people come from all over? You will be fined. You will be punished. You will be, I mean, it's just going on and on. I kept sitting there thinking, any moment we're going to hear, we recognize your voice, Dr. Rodney Howard Brown. You're about to go back in the slammer. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> we did not quite hear that. But as we all sat there with our mouths open, he said, I did not make this up, did I? Not that any one of us suspected that he did. And he said, Debbie, I want you to tell the people tonight that this information is out there 
So he should not be punished in any way for delivering this today because anybody can go to AI and ask any of these same things and you'll hear everything that he preached in that message today. It is, it is that out there in the open. They aren't even ashamed of it. They're proud of it. And so thank God that we come to a church where we aren't stupid, naive, caught unaware, that we know how to have all night prayer meetings. We know how to win the lost at any cost. We know time is short and we have a job to do. And so that's really, even in a nutshell, if you're tuning in for the first time, what the stand is all about. Because it began when they tried to shut the church down before. And Pastor Rodney said, we won't shut down, we won't bend, we won't bow, we won't stop, we won't compromise. And we will protest every antichrist spirit alive in this country and in the world today. And we, the blood-bought church, shall rise up and be who we are, the church without spot or wrinkle. And this stand shall go on until Jesus comes or until everyone is free from all tyranny. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, I have the privilege for a few minutes Teaching on the subject of stewardship, and any of you who've been around for a while know some of my testimony and know that it's a place I love to teach from because it's very real to me. But the Holy Spirit directed me in a little bit different, uh, along different lines tonight than possibly I've ever gone in my own revival meetings or here or anywhere. So I can't wait to hear it tonight. And I want to start with 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 20. 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 20. Now, if you have just tuned in online, you may be saying, what? What's the stewardship stuff? This is a part of the gospel that will change your life forever as it has changed mine forever. You can't leave this part out. Well, I guess you can leave this part out. If you don't ever want to do anything, change anything, make a difference in this world, help anybody, act like Jesus, or obey the word of God, yeah, you're welcome to leave it out then. But if you are actually a Christian, you don't have any choice except to say, Lord, Father God, you are first and foremost a giver. The Bible says, for God so loved the world that he what, blew a kiss? For God so loved the world that he held up a waving hand, love you. For God so loved the world that he painted a house. No, so God loved the world so much that he gave. That he gave extra? No, he gave his only, he gave his best. That's who he is. And when we get like him, we become the same. So 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 20. And they rose early in the morning and went forth into the wilderness of Tekoa. And as they went forth, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah. And I say tonight, Hear me, O Tampa. Hear me, O River Church. Hear me, everybody watching online. And you inhabitants of Jerusalem, believe in the Lord your God so shall you be established, but it doesn't end there. That's part of it. Believe his prophets, so shall ye prosper. How many people do you hear say things like this? You know, I'll give to God, I just won't give to man or ministries. Uh, hello? I want to watch how tall your pole is. How you get it directly to God, bypassing people, churches, ministries. That sounds very interesting. Never heard of such a thing. And there are other people who say, well, if God tells me to give, I will give. But I'm not listening to any man. Let me look at this again. <laughs> Just checking in to see if the Bible agrees with that. Oh, doesn't look like it does. Believe his prophets. Because God speaks through them, not nonprofits, 
Not wacky people running around calling themselves prophets. That doesn't count. Don't listen to a word they say. I just encountered something a couple weeks ago. I said, if I encounter one more wacky so-called prophet out there, God's going to have to help me. Because every time I have, well, I'll just stop there. Believe his prophets, real ones. But see, the enemy would like to get us to believe there aren't any real ones because of all the fakes out there. But there are real ones. Believe his prophets, so shall ye go broke. Oops, sorry. Believe his prophets, they just want your money. Oops, that's not right either. Believe his prophets, so shall ye prosper. And yet some people, when they hear a true man or woman of God, even start to talk along these lines, ah, uh, I know what they're going to say. I, I, I don't listen to that stuff. I don't listen to it from any man. Uh, you're not going to prosper then, not according to the word of God. Zechariah chapter 7, verses 6 and 7. And when ye did eat and when ye did drink, did not ye eat for yourselves? Oh, we got a lot of people doing that. And drink for yourselves? We're supposed to be eating and drinking for other people. I'm supposed to get so filled up that I'm spilling out on everybody I get around. Out of my belly and out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. We drink so we get so full that we change everybody who gets around us. We don't just do it for ourselves, for our own goosebumps and our own giggles. There, I ate and drank tonight. That's no different than natural gluttons and people out there in bars. But spiritual people say, I'm eating the steak of the word, and I'm drinking of the new wine, and I'm letting those rivers flow in me so they can flow out of me for somebody else. He said, should you not hear the words which the Lord hath cried by the former prophets? Oh, there we go again. When Jerusalem was inhabited and in prosperity... So he's saying once upon a time, remember, Jerusalem was prosperous because they were listening to the prophets and the cities thereof round about her when men inhabited the south and the plain. Now, I had something happen the last, just a couple of days ago that really affected me. I had the privilege, you know, many times when Pastor Rodney has taken certain people around the racetrack, it seems like I'm always gone and then one day I was going to get to, and it rained or something. They thought it was unsafe. I'm like, man, Lord, I'm the speed lover around here. I should get to do this sometime. <laughs> I know I might not look the part, but different things come in different packages. <laughs> and, and it just so happened that myself and, and several other ministers got invited to go around the track the other day. And... Uh, Wow, that was fun. That's all I can say. <laughs> I tell you what, God likes suddenlies. He's not a gradually God. But anyway. <laughs> and so after a fun day at the track, and we all had some fellowship and good talks, then we ended up at a garage there on the track that Pastor has purchased. And um, we are standing there. And this is very hard to, to put into words. So I'm asking the Holy Ghost, by his presence, to make real to you what he made real to me. Because sometimes words just don't convey it. He's got to sit on this the way he did for me. Let me back up before I finish that. A couple of years ago, when I was still, over two years ago, when I was still located in Washington State, and I came down for one of the camp meetings or conferences, of course, he had just purchased that, that yacht, Lady Adonica. And I'm sitting at the table with, with them and a bunch of ministers, and they're passing the picture around. And everybody, and there's nothing wrong with that, everybody is just talking about boats, and people are talking about what boats they have been on, and just casual fellowship conversation. But I looked at the picture, and this took me off guard. I did not expect this. I started to weep. And everybody else is just going, yeah, last time I was in a boat, I got sick and started throwing up. <laughs> or somebody else is saying some other silly thing, and I'm standing there going, or sitting at the table weeping. And I thought, people are going to think I'm having a nervous breakdown or something. 
what is wrong with me, Lord? But what I was seeing <laughs> was not a beautiful yacht. I hope to shout a boat, a car, a house, or any natural blessing of the Lord doesn't move you so much that you cry just because it's so nice. Because there are so many more important things that we're called on earth to do. And those blessings just follow us when we're doing that. That's not what I saw, a nice yacht. I looked at that. And I saw the day, because remember, I've been around this ministry for 32 years. And I immediately am thinking of different times, like when God said, I want you to go to New York City and hold the biggest soul-winning crusade that has been held since the 50s with Dr. Billy Graham. And I was around them when they didn't have a penny of it. And they're going to need, they weren't even sure in the beginning, six, seven million dollars. But they don't have a penny of it. And so they end up mortgaging their own home because souls are more important than where they live. And I was with them. When ministers that they had so blessed and because they went to their churches and, and labored for weeks, churches that were about to go under, that were now flourishing in revival and, and the pastors blessed. And, and I, I'm thinking of all these pictures of things I've seen and how those ministers wouldn't even return a call when he went to Good News New York, let alone give. And he said he felt like he went to the garden alone. That old hymn. And uh, I am, I'm thinking of the time they were trying to buy. You've heard pastors say it many times. I used to know exactly how many computers. Can somebody tell me when they were trying to buy at one time? 20. 20 computers. And they didn't have the finances nor the credit to buy 20 computers. But he said, I'm going to keep blessing and I'm going to keep giving while we're trying to figure out a way to do this. I was here over on Bush Boulevard before we got this building and this property. When, of course, he was going to New York to prepare for Good News New York. And he ends up meeting Bill Wilson, uh, the man who had, at least at that time, the largest, I believe, Sunday school in the country, possibly the world. And he said, I want you to come to the river and I want you to j just talk to the people about the importance of winning souls. And Bill Wilson being kind of this matter-of-fact kind of rough guy, he just said, well, you know, I'll probably have to let you know at the last minute when I can come. And Pastor Rodney, being who he is, said, all right, just let me know, and we'll work it in. And so Bill, if I remember right, I think he only gives him like two days' notice that he's coming down. It couldn't have been at a worse time in the natural pastor has to believe for millions of dollars, now he's got a speaker coming in that he's going to want to bless with an offering when he needs so much himself. And on top of it, he didn't have time to really get word out. It wasn't one of our better crowds at the river. And Bill Wilson gets up and gives his testimony, and I'm only going to give you this much, as he talks about what it was like to be a little boy that his mother walked with him downtown, had a hold of his hand, and then while they're standing on a street corner, she just lets go of his hand and walks away. And Bill Wilson thinks, well, I don't know where mom's going, but, you know, I think he was like 10 or 11 years old. Well, surely she'll be back any minute. And she just never came back. She just left him there. And through a series of events, when God got a hold of his life, he was determined to not leave any child on a street corner. And he ended up buying buses and picking up orphans everywhere. So as he's sharing this story, which I had never heard before, we were all very moved. Then Pastor Rodney gets up and he says, he said, you know, when I invited Bill to come, I didn't know when he was going to be able to come. I know we didn't manage to have as big of a crowd as I'd like tonight. I know we're all believing for big things right now. But I never told Brother Bill this, but I decided when he came, I'm going to believe to buy two buses for his Sunday school. 
And I didn't ask pastor about any of these details today, but I think I have them close enough because some things are just etched in my mind when I'm very moved. And I think he said that they were going to be, um, I think, $14,000 a piece. He said, so I was believing for $28,000 to give you for your buses. And so if everybody did what I did, I want to believe they did, we dug down. Not that big of a crowd, but we dug down. Now, I'm sitting there in the front row, so I'm pretty close to Pastor Rodney when he's standing there, and I, an usher comes up and speaks in his ear, and I could just tell by his expression, I thought, oh my goodness, I know what he's about to do, because I could see it on his face. His eyes fill with tears, and he's pleased, and he said, oh wow, thank you folks for the way you gave. Brother Bill, we're able to get you both of those buses. Oh, that's not the end of it. He said, but God just spoke to me. We're going to give you the buses anyway, but we're also going to give to you personally everything that came in tonight. And so it was like about double of what he was believing to give him when he needs millions and is mortgaging his home to have a soul winning crusade. He doubles what he's going to give to somebody else. And I sat there and I thought, that's my pastor. That's all I've ever watched them do from day one. I remember many years ago, shortly after we got this building, that he was in one of the nations and they were in one of the nations in Africa. I don't remember which one. But I had the privilege, I came off the road that week and he said, I want you to take Sunday service, Debbie, and the midweek service, which was Tuesday night at that time. And he said... Now, I don't want the rest of the people to know this because how many know they never list needs? They put the demand on the word and on the anointing. He said, but since you're in charge of the service, I want you to believe him with me. We need a gigantic financial miracle this week. And he told me what it was, and I about thought, oh, I needed one too, and I didn't tell him that, but all of a sudden mine didn't seem so big. It did a few minutes before that, but, but I thought, yeah, I need one too this week. And he said, just believe me, for, believe with me for our miracle. And I said, I will. And he said, by the way, in that Tuesday night midweek service, you can receive an offering for yourself too. And I thought, thank God, and I'm going to believe for my miracle. <laughs> and so we received the church's offering. We received mine. And, uh, and just after we did... Pastor Rodney comes on a big screen and interrupts the service to tell us what's going on in Africa. And he says this, he's crying, and I thought, oh no, I think I know that expression too. And he says, he says, I just met Pastor so-and-so from whichever nation it was. He said he's believing God to build a new church. He, he doesn't have any room, and God just spoke to me to give him 100,000 American dollars. And I stood there watching that on the screen going, oh, he doesn't have that himself, and now he's going to give it, and he need, ah, even though I'd had years of watching this by now. And, it's, and he's just weeping, not because he's worried about it. He is weeping with joy at what God spoke to him. And to see the look on that pastor's face of the miracle that is taking place for that pastor. And I thought, oh, dear God. Yes, Lord, you don't even have to say it. If he can give that to him when he needs his miracle, yes, I can give mine back to the river when I need this miracle. And then they tell me after the service what mine was, and it was miraculous, and it was just what I needed. But I thought if my pastor can give 100 gram when he needs millions, I can give my miraculous offering back to him when I need thousands. Because it all works relative for wherever you're at. 
And how amazing. He got his miracle. I got my miracle. This is all I have known for 32 years because we have followed in the steps. Whenever they stretch, whenever they declare, whenever they believe, whenever they get a fresh vision, whenever they say, God, we're going higher, we're not staying here, then right behind them, uh, yes, on a much lesser level, but right behind them, I'm going, then I'll stretch, then I'll get a fresh vision, then I'll give like I've never given before, then we'll step over in that glory realm because God, if you did it for that African, you could do it for this Alaskan. God, if you did it for that man, you could do it for this woman, for you are no respecter of persons. You're only a respecter of principles. Now, when I first heard them, and many of you have heard my whole testimony, which I'm not going to take time to give. I'm just going to highlight a couple of things. When I encountered them in Anchorage, Alaska in November of 1992, I'm living in with other people because I could no longer afford to stay in this cruddy old trailer that me and my three sons were living in. I mean, I could just barely do the rent, but I couldn't keep it warm because the fuel oil costs more than the rent did. So I moved in with some people from my church. I had a total car that my son drove off a mountain learning to drive. Obviously, he had a ways to go. <laughs> and it was one of those corkscrew roads, gravel covered with ice. And he had too much speed around. It was actually coming down from my prison ministry. I found myself thinking, oh, Lord, I'm up here getting inmates who are in here for life saved. And we total a car. This is awesome. But around that first curb, my son, I knew he had too much speed. His name's Joshua. And all we remember is me calling out as we became airborne at the top of a mountain, Joshua. It's a good name to call out at a time like that. God save us. God be with us. God do anything. God give us a safety net. Anything. We hit a tree at the bottom. Everybody at the prison came. Well, not everybody at the prison. They didn't let all the inmates out to see if we were okay. But <laughs> thanks for your wreck. They let us out to check on you. <laughs> no, the, the officials came running down, and they just knew we were dead, and we walked out without a scratch on us. Thank God for the blood of Jesus. But I still owed a bunch of money on that little tiny Chevrolet Cavalier. And uh, I just got to tell you for the fun of it, I was given this testimony one time here at the river, and I said, that little Chevy car, and I saw Pastor Rodney go, I thought, what'd I say? And when we, after the service, he goes, I can't believe you swore. I said, swore? And then when he told me what he thought, I said, I said, no. I said, little Chevy car. Chevy, Chevy. <laughs> but now that you mention it, that word might have been appropriate. But I did, I've never used that. I wouldn't use that. <laughs> but, but. Good thing we didn't have the same media team. I would have got a bleep too, and I didn't even say it. <laughs> but so I still, <laughs> I still owed a lot of money on that little stupid car. We'll just call it stupid. <laughs> and the insurance company said, we'll pay it off, but you don't have any money for another car. So you got to drive this one. <laughs> I looked at it. Three doors completely crashed in. The hood, the grill, it didn't have a window left in it. We got plastic and duct tape for windows. I got a black, <laughs> it was a little red car, and I got a black hood out of the junkyard. So it was two-toned, red and black. Almost reminds me of one I drive now, except there's some differences. <laughs> and, so... The thing went down the highway at an angle, but it still had four tires and an engine. And I'm telling you, when you've got a red hot on fire evangelist full of revival, if it has four tires and an engine, there is no stopping you. And that was the beginning days of this worldwide ministry that's gone into 53 nations now. 
in a, a wrecked car that went down the highway sideways and living in with other people and people coming out of the woodwork to tell me why I could not fulfill the call of God. Many of you have heard this so many times you could give it, but I'm going to give it again for those who are brand new. So another minister who happened to be a word of faith minister, and as I've said many times, I'm so thankful that he wasn't a word of doubt and unbelief. It could have really been discouraging. <laughs> he said to me, he had never heard me preach. He didn't know me, but I was invited to a meeting where he was at. Anyway, afterwards, he said, lady, I heard what happened to you and your family. Go home. Forget whatever you think is this call of God. I'll give you three reasons you can't fulfill this call. Number one, I always say here, I need a drum roll because great revelation is coming. Thank you. Number one, you are a woman. <laughs> And I've always wished I would have gotten up, stood in front of a mirror and went, oh my goodness, I am. I never knew that till the man of God came and brought me wisdom from on high. <laughs> Number two, Alaska is cold. Well, duh. I have just come from Barrow. Anybody know where that is? On the Arctic Ocean. Yes, of course, my team does because we just returned there. I thought, I'm going to make real missionaries out of you. <laughs> It's, <laughs> it's actually on the Arctic Ocean. It was 65 degrees below zero without the wind chill. The sun never came up the whole two weeks I was there in December. Never even rose a little bit at high noon. And now I need a man of God who lives in a nice warm place and goes up to Alaska once a year to fish, hunt, spend a weekend in a comfortable church, to help pay for the fishing trip, say, Alaska is cold. And number three, you have no husband. I was very aware of that. <laughs> he had walked out the door with another lady, and now I needed him to tell me, that means you are now alone. Thank you for this marvelous revelation. So just forget this call of God, go home. Well, anyway, just a, a few weeks later, I'm invited to go to this powerful revival in Anchorage. I have to drive 65 miles over icy winter roads in November that are laden with moose, the stupidest of all animals, <laughs> that stand by the edge of the road, chewing their cud, doing nothing until a car is coming on the ice at 55 or 60 miles an hour. And you can tell, even by their expression, that it changes like, huh. Maybe I should just slowly mosey out in front of that car on the ice. And I thought, I don't know how many more totalings my car can handle. And I didn't have any gas to go to the meetings. I had to borrow gasoline. I dreaded going alone when all the other ministers would be in couples. And there was not one good reason to go except for my friend who told me about the meeting said, Debbie, what glory is in those meetings? And when she said the word glory, <laughs> the heavy, heavier still, heavy laden, Shekinah came through those telephone wires. Back in the days, we had wires. <laughs> I saw a dinosaur or two outside the windows. <laughs> but came through those wires <laughs> and laid heavily upon me. And I went to the floor, rolling and laughing and crying in another tongues. And when I picked up the phone, I thought, oh, I had a friend on that phone. I'm sure she's no longer on there. But I was wrong. She was having the same experience on the other end. <laughs> and I said, I'll drop everything and I'll get into those meetings. They carried me out of those meetings. Pastor announced he was having a pastor's luncheon. I almost didn't go. I, I just said, I'm, I'm resigning my church. I'm going to go full time as an evangelist. I'm not technically a pastor anymore. And my friend said, oh, Debbie, you haven't had any pastoral fellowship. Besides that, he's from Africa. We think he just means ministers. Luncheon, you need to go. So I did. 
everybody was looking at me. I pull up in that crooked car with the plastic windows <laughs> alone when all the other couples were couples. Pastor is just goofing around. I still remember he has a chicken leg in his hand. He's telling funny stories. And he looks up and he says, lady. And I thought, oh, he's talking to somebody. Hmm. And I see them looking at me. And I went, me? And he went, yes, God has a word for you. And I thought, oh, no. <laughs> Excuse me. I thought, I'm going to hear. You're a woman. Alaska's cold. You have no husband. I'm like, Lord, I don't know if I can do this. And he said, God just showed me that somebody else discouraged you weeks ago. He told me to tell you just the opposite. Everything he told you as a child, he's still about to do. It shall be an international ministry. God knows you have no money, no contacts, no help, no decent car, no nothing, no reputation. And God himself will lift you up out of the middle of this. And he will launch you all over the world. And he will receive the glory from it. And people will know that what he's done for you, like I'm making plain tonight, that he will do for everybody else who gets as hungry, who gets as thirsty, who follows in the same principles. And he prophesied, I never even told you that part because believe it or not, I'm trying to make it brief. But when the other guy had, had said what he said, I got a hold of God and I prophesied to myself in a tape recorder. I still have that tape. 98% of that has come to pass. And then Pastor Rodney comes along and prophesies word for word what I had prophesied myself. Now, that is how the first touch began. What I want you to see, I have never heard Pastor Rodney ever call himself a prophet. Has anybody else heard that? Didn't think so. Because true ones don't have to say it. But when somebody prophesies 9-11... And they've prophesied our cities being quarantined. And they've prophesied every major event in this nation and the world. And they've prophesied to individuals of us that turned our entire lives around. And when you've been with somebody 32 years or around them and you've watched the track record. I've never heard him mention being an apostle. But when you have this many graduates, this many river churches, this many Bible schools springing up all over the world, you wouldn't have to now, would you? And there's only one reason I'm saying this. Sometimes people can get used to anointing. They can get used to teaching. They can get used to preaching. They can get used to a certain voice. They can get used to the manifestations of the Holy Ghost. They can get used to the gifts of the Spirit. And they can start to go... Oh, yeah, yeah, another nice night at the river, whatever. I think I kind of need to check my Facebook right now. I have sat around ministers here. I know, my I'm going to make my team nervous now. <laughs> I've sat around ministers and thinking, dear God, who does this whippersnapper think they are <laughs> when, he is, when he is under the anointing and they're going, yeah, don't forget to come to my meeting. I'm like, you're on your Facebook. You're on your Instagram. I've watched them do it in my meetings too. I don't know if they think we're that dumb or what. <laughs> and then I've watched some of them when he starts to walk around. I have literally watched this. People just looking at this and, oh, he's coming. He's going to be here in a minute. <gasps> and I thought, ah. Oh. <laughs> I'm serious. I don't care how talented, how many years of Bible school you've done, how many departments you've served in, what it takes to get, it takes to keep. And you ought to keep your spirit in your ear like this all the time. God, I'm getting something out of this service tonight I have never gotten. I'm going to hear from you like I've never heard from you. I am going to hear from heaven tonight, and I'm going to let you go where you have never gone in me tonight. And every time they talk about giving, and every time they talk about for London, I mean, 
over a million of that has come in, but over a million of it, they still, they still need to reach in a few weeks. But you notice how he talks about it now? Oh, that'll come in easily. That's chunk change. change. I can remember when a million dollars to them would have been like, oh, God. How you gonna, but they're so used to watching God exponentially increase this ministry. And, and what they can believe for now is so far above trying to believe for 20 computers. How do you get there, folks? Do you fall off a wagon and you're just there tomorrow? No, when you need millions, when it, it, it just, I mean, I can think of so many examples, Shreveport, so many soul winning crusades, but going back to New York, they couldn't even turn, nobody would even turn a microphone on or a light on, I believe it was on Tuesdays in New York, until he paid, I believe, $280,000 just for the union to turn a microphone on. Do you know, I can't remember what the deadline time was, I'm just going to say I don't know. I'm going to say 4.30. I, I don't remember it specifically. But you know, at 3.30, they usually had about 25 bucks of it. And he'd be singing those David Ingalls songs, El Shaddai, all the ones we get used to him singing still today. I'm peculiar. He'd be singing those faith-filled songs. Oh, God. Oh, God. I'm going to release the little bit I have and give. I'm going to, and, and he'd get the call. Oh, good news, Pastor. A hundred grand just came in. Twenty-five came in here. Fifty came in here. And he would have it every week. But he never let off. He never let off giving. They never let off confessing. They never let off praying. They never let off worshiping. They never let off yielding. They didn't say, oh, we got, they never have. We've got news reporters here tonight as they, as, as they have had on these grounds before. Oh, we got politicians here. We're going to tone it down. No, I'm trying to stick a lot in fast. But if you're going to have what somebody else have, you got to yield like they do. You got to be no respecter of persons. You can't compromise. You can't be bought. You've got to continue to give and be stretched. And when you've got a general, and besides all those other offices and more that I just, you know what? That's another thing. I remember when they had a minister say, who do you think you are starting a church? You are no pastor. In fact, while we're on the subject, you are no apostle. You are no prophet. You are no teacher. And you're not even really an evangelist. You know what pastor said? Thank you for confirming what I've always known, that I am nothing and he is everything. Thank you for... Most of you wouldn't know this, but I've watched that man and his wife be escorted to the front row at conferences. And I just go, okay, note to self. Always walk in love. Always walk in forgiveness. Be quick to repent, quick to forgive, and keep giving, and keep being hungry, and keep pressing in. And guess what? Guess what? Then people go, how did they get here? And they don't realize that they're being given a lesson Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, church, conferences, Bible school, on the road. Everything they're doing, we're supposed to be watching and listening by precept and example because God is no respecter of persons. And they have a job to teach us, not by what they say as much. Of course, it's important to teach the word, but to be living it out in front of us. I remember, was it, uh, was it January conference? I think a lot of us sat there. This pastor would go, oh, I just met this pastor from Africa. God just told me to give you 10,000. Oh, pastor so-and-so, I, I see you're here. Uh, I'm going to give you 100,000. Oh, pastor so-and-so, I see you're here. I'm going to give you, and remember, Pastor Eric would get up and go, oh, pastor, may I remind you what we have coming up and the budget. <laughs> And that is so impossible to do in the natural. I watched him do it in 92. I watched them give like that in 95. I watched them give like that when they were believing for buildings. And I watched them give like that in every crusade. And I watched them give like that when they had a little bit, when they had a little bit more, when they had a whole lot more. But just what they give grows exponentially. And so it's all the same. What it takes to get, it takes to keep. Now, I was here when Tim Hall, years ago, 
got up and talked about, I don't know if any others were, because Tim Hall, the evangelist from Australia, he's a good friend of mine too. I love that man. And I love his humor. I love everything about him. And he said, he, he's a big uh, World War II buff, really of a lot of wars. But he likes to study the airplanes, the ships, and everything in the stories. And he ends up drawing a picture of Pastor Rodney, and it was so hilarious. Because all of a sudden, he remembered a story from World War II. I'm not going to tell the whole story. But, you know, it looked like, it looked like the American ship was done for with the Japanese ship. But anyway, in the end, in the end... Um, the good guys wouldn't give up, and even though uh, that that everybody was pretty much blown up on the ship and their hair was on fire and didn't have any clothes on, the general he still like had charge, and he said, "That's what I see in you, Pastor Rodney. No clothes on and hair on fire. Go in charge." And of course, everybody started laughing. And that night, I had a dream, and I don't have very many of those. And that thing came alive on the inside of me that we are following the general. When it comes to the blessing of God, when it comes to salvation, when it comes to healing, when it comes to joy, when it comes to our covenant promises, we all get to come to the table the same. We're all his kids equal. But when it comes to rank in the body of Christ and who is following who, there is rank. I'm going to try to make this plain very quickly. Let's say a general has three sons. One son has been in the army following his dad for quite a while. He's now a colonel. The next son came in the army later. He's a, he's a sergeant. And then the butt private just came in on his last birthday. They come home for Christmas. They're around the table. Mom says, look, here's turkey, here's dressing, here's potatoes, gravy. I love you all. And dad says, I love you all the same. Everybody dig in. We got a pile of presents equal for all of you. Everybody's enjoying it. They're at mom and dad's table. They're getting the presents. They're getting the food just the same. And then the general gets a call. We're at war. Colonel, I want you over there now. Sergeant, I want you in the tank. Private, I want you in the ditch with a rifle. You think those boys are going to go, oh, dad, that's silly. I don't like tanks. I don't like ditches. I'm your kid. I think I should be able to do what my older brother's doing. No, you can at the table. You can with the presence. You can with the promises. But when we go to war, when we go to war, you are in the army now. And you follow now, I'm going to try to wrap this up quickly. I got a lot here that I knew, especially since I never did it quite this way before. I had no idea how long I would be taking with it. But I will finish with this. Sometimes, sometimes, does anybody here ever get frustrated with themselves? And you start, oh, good. I, I'm so glad you didn't all sprout wings. And I'm like, oh, great. I'm the only one. So embarrassing. Somebody else should be up here. And you think, I should be farther than I am. I mean, when Pastor Rodney prophesied, I never quite finished that story. I'll never probably tell it this short again. But after he prophesied that, that I'm in the meeting, he's teaching on giving. Like some people probably watching tonight, I'm like, ah, I don't need this part. I came for more joy. Revival had hit my life by then. I came for the signs and wonders, the altar calls, people getting healed, set free. Not to hear somebody teach about giving. Besides that, I went to a faith school, and I had a course on it, and I got an A on the test. <laughs> you talk about stupid and stupider. Pride makes people really stupid. And I thought, I got an A in the test. I don't need this. I drove there in a total car and borrowed money to put gas in my tank to get there. I'm living in with other people, the poorest person in the auditorium. But because I had a course on it and could quote some verses he was reading, I didn't think I needed it. Thank God the Holy Ghost broke through my stubbornness, my pride, my stupidity, and said, Debbie, I've called you to go all over the world and you don't have enough to go down the street. How do you think you're going to do that on your A's? I've said many times, you can take that any way you want to. I believe God has a sense of humor, and that shook me up. I knew I couldn't go around the world in my A's. And he said, I've sent this man all the way from South Africa up to Alaska so that you can do everything I told you as a child. And if you will repent, if you will repent right now of your arrogance 
and your small thinking and your feeling sorry for yourself and, and all of that, I will set you free from poverty this night. Now, he did. He did. <laughs> Hallelujah. He did. <laughs> And 53 nations later, and helping to build churches on the foreign field, and launching my own Bible school and church in the state of uh, Washington. And um, I just think of what we just gave in Cape Town. There was a day if I could just receive that, let alone give that back to the people. Shakarabaprosko. <laughs> and so much more. But when you start listening to people's testimonies, and I'm going to close with this part because the Holy Ghost just said, make it real, Debbie, because people are dealing with this. How many know, no matter how many testimonies you have of your own, when you listen to other people's, you're like, oh, I should be farther along than this. I broke through 32 years ago. Have I plateaued, Lord? <laughs> but you notice, <laughs> let me just give you this example. If you go, God, I'm still paying for my home and I got a long way to go. You notice that's what the devil tells you. He doesn't say, could you have even imagined to live in a home like that years ago? Does he tell you, oh, what about when you needed 50 grand to buy that church building and somebody walked up to you and said, I had given my offering to them 20 some years before in Atlanta, Georgia, and never had seen them since. And they said, do you remember what you did for me and my family? I've been looking for you for 20 years to say thank you. And that $1,500 I had given away in my offering now became 50 grand. And it's just what the bank demanded. And we only had a week to cut and nobody knew about it. The devil doesn't say, what about this? What about 53 nations? What about how you've done this here and God has blessed you here? He just says, oh, you don't have that one. That one's testifying about. You haven't come very far, have you? See, he says it to all of us. To all of us. And then you stop and think and go, you stinking lying devil. And you're so terrified, aren't you, of us remembering how big God has been. <laughs> and I started thinking about just a few things through the years and got chug a lug and drunk on the Holy Ghost. <laughs> Don't think about in comparison with somebody else's testimony, oh, I just must not be. Uh, you start thinking about where you used to be and where you are and how he's blessed you and how big he's been and how he's healed you and how he's sustained you and how he's filled you and how he has thrilled you. Big God, big God. And if we're going to keep going from glory to glory, how many would like to do that? Yeah. You, don't, you don't dare do this. Oh, the first time I heard Pastor Rodney or somebody else teaching on it, I grabbed it. But no. How many people do we have to hear teach on it? How many times can we hear about the oil in the cupboard? <laughs> and the widow woman and her little boy's last meal. How many more times do we have to hear, I'll be blessed coming in, blessed going out. You don't have to hear it, and you don't have to be blessed coming in and blessed going out. But some of us are going to go bring it on again, because I'm going to be blessed coming in and blessed going out. I will be the head and not the tail, above and not beneath. He gives me power to get wealth so that he may establish his covenant. Hallelujah! And I'm not only going to hear it again. Do you know when the rest of these pastors get up and teach it? I never one time sit there and go, oh my, I teach on it myself. Pretty sure I've used that verse too. You're done when you get like that. I go, I haven't ever heard it before because I haven't heard it like I need to hear it yet or I'd be doing more than I'm doing right now. I'm a nation shaker. I'm a revivalist. I've got to get this like I have never gotten it. I'll tell you one thing. If we asked AI how you get this, she won't be able to spit it out. <laughs> it can only be gotten by hungry 
thirsty people that make a demand on the anointing that say, I'm not just hearing with natural ears tonight. Oh, God, if you did it. I'm, I'm saying this with all due respect, all due respect and honor, but I got to get it across. If you can do it for Dr. Rodney Howard Brown, I realize he's got a different call, a different assignment, but you are obligated to bless my socks off too. You are obligated according to your word. Because I'm in a covenant with you. One that's established upon better promises. But part of that covenant is not just what I get from you. Part of the covenant is all the days of my life. I will give unto you. I will honor you. I will hunger for you. I will obey you. I will yield to you. I will forgive. I will walk in love. I will get hungrier. I will get thirstier. I'll obey again. I don't care where you tell me to go, what you tell me to do, and how impossible it looks, what it takes to get, it takes to keep. I will follow the general. Hallelujah. 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 I will never go, oh, the general's trying to get something to me like he's gotten. I'm bored with that now. I'm going to go, look how hard he's trying. He doesn't have to. They have broken through. But he gets up here every time to go, you can do it too. You can have it too. You can take the nations too. You can be a water walker too. You can be a fire starter too. This is a place for that. This isn't, I think you figured it out by now. This isn't some three points in a poem, church service, ever. This is a launching pad. This, we, us, we are the restraining force in the world today against the Antichrist. So we better not ever start relaxing and going, oh, one of those again. Tonight, we have an opportunity, and I'm talking to you by way of the internet as well. We have an opportunity to finish paying for London. I, for one, am going, and I'll tell you why. I haven't in years just gone to some place that pastor has gone. I'm not trying to ride in their coattails. But when he announced Cape Town and he announced London, both of those just exploded on the inside of me. I heard something different than I've ever heard. I heard it's now or never. I've heard it is now. We can't let London go down now. And I thought, you know, when they leave, people are still going to be hungry. It has to count now. I don't care how many we have in here tonight. I look out here and I see, especially with everybody watching by way of the Internet, we have more than enough to finish off London. The United Kingdom isn't going down in our watch. The world isn't going down in our watch. Oh, how I would like to see their faces. That I know they know it'll be taken care of by the time they go anyway, but wouldn't it be fun to say, oh, I was taken care of them one night and then some. Some of you have watched freely. You have received. It's time to freely give. I'm talking to businessmen. I'm talking to millionaires. I'm talking to billionaires. I'm talking to thousand and heirs. <laughs> that instead of, ah, someday maybe I'll throw in a 20. Are you kidding me? You are blessed to be a blessing. To stop this tyranny going on out there. And say revival is going all over the world. And God has called us to do it. You may say, lady, around here we're stretched all the time. How I know. <laughs> How I know. And guess what? We're going to be stretched some more. Because we're going, to go in, we're going into Canaan's land, the land flowing with milk and honey. We are going into the land where we will live in houses we didn't build. And we will have vineyards we didn't plant. And he'll irrigate it. We're going into the land of milk and honey where it takes big men to carry home the breakfast grapes. This is ours in Jesus' name. So right now, you have an opportunity to step into that level. And some of you have known it, but you've backed off. The devil's a liar. And I'm here to remind you what it takes to get, it takes to keep. Hallelujah.